get started? Good yes, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final episode for now, for now, for now in our Outspoken series. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, I, I don't think we need to go into why we've been doing this if you all are regulars, but you know, it's a project that started four weeks ago and you know, it's four weeks now. So really, uh, it's been really fun working with, with Professor Loredana to be doing this. Um, do, do you want to say anything before I introduce Yu Yi? No, I'm so excited about it that I'm going to shut okay, up. Okay, okay. okay. All so, anyway, today, so, so today's okay. topic is about hustle, right? And so I want to introduce, uh, you see her name there, Rihanna Halim. Uh, a bit of you, if you know about her, she's uh, very confusing. Vietnamese, Chinese, Vietnamese, Chinese, father's Indonesian, Chinese, but the parents met in Taiwan. I know the sister. And then after that, of course, I became friends with her as well. So she was on in Media Corp in Singapore for the longest time. And then that name was Lin Yu Yi, Yu Yi, right? Yes, and, you got it right. Yes. So she was not used to it because she's been called Iriana all her life. So thank you for being with us. And, you know, and, and the reason I, I invited her was because uh, I think she left the comforts of Media Corp because um, how it is there and in Singapore, right, uh, to, to strike out on her own. So I thought, you know, she'd be great for this topic on hustle. So we, we're going to get uh, started with a couple of questions on what we think. Oh, yes, a couple of reminders. Please mute your mics, keep your camera off. Uh, and you can chat and ask us questions in the chat box uh, as well. Uh, so anyway, we, we, we want to talk about hustle. And I think the first question is, you know, where did this whole idea of hustling uh, come about? If, if you, maybe I'll just start a little bit about my, my story. Um, I've always, I've never had one job. I've always had something, even from my first job when I was working as a receptionist at 17 years old at the Kuching Hilton, my part-time job was singing for the Sarawak Choir. So I've always had two things, right? And I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, well, back, that was a long time ago, but way back when. And um, there is a lot of, uh, of me that likes to learn new things and try new things. But the seed of that probably stems from my father, who was then working. I, I was born in Brunei, and my father was working for an oil company. You all should know one oil company there. And my father was with this one and only company for 30 over years, and he was supposed to uh, stay on for another three years. And then he was told that in the three years, after, uh, three years before he was due for retirement, that his contract was not renewed. And so I said, okay. So it wasn't a financial thing. He said, okay, I've worked for 30 over years. Mm. And I was like, wow can be with an organization for so long and there's no loyalty and you know your your plans could just change because someone tells you right uh, that your service is no more required so I think that hustling spirit and not being dependent on one source of income has always been at the back of my mind mm -hmm. um, and, you know if you read Kiyosaki's book as well right you know uh, if you're employed self-employed and all these sort of things right so you, I'm always looking at other sources of income Loredana, you've got an interesting story too. So I, um, I was thinking about today and I was thinking about why, why am I a hustler? And it has to go back to my grandmother. I'll talk about her in a little bit, but uh, uh, for those of you who, who know me, I say this all the time. I had different, 19 different professions, not jobs. I had more than 19 jobs, but I had 19 different professions. I've done anything from working in agriculture, being a life insurance agent, working in hospitality, media, transportation, logistics, uh, education, fashion, God knows what. <laughs> and at some point I remember being in college, especially when I was in college, my, my country, I'm from Romania, was going through a really, really bad economic um, downturn. We, we just suffered a major Ponzi scheme, so the whole country was, was collapsing. And I remember having two full-time jobs and one part-time job at the same time while I was going to college. So I would have a night shift, a day shift, in between two, three hours to choose one class to go to, to school, uh, working all the weekends. And I also have to say, I partied a lot. So I don't know exactly what happened to that girl, but- <laughs> Oh, bring her back. <laughs> but then I was thinking, where, where did this come from? And it has to go back to my, my grandmother. So uh, my grandmother survived the, the Second World War. And then uh, after the Second World War, not that that was not bad enough, we had communism, which was really, really bad because the communists took, took away everything that you had. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but my grandmother knew how to make money out of a, a, a stone. She knew, not money per se, but for example, during communism, you had money, but there was nothing to buy with the money. So there was no products, there was no food, there was no like clothes or anything like that. And my grandmother would, would find a piece of fabric that was probably made for, I don't know, a, a bedding or a pillow, and she would make me a dress. Uh, she learned how to cook professionally. She learned how to sew professionally. Uh, she, uh, she started her own illegal mini boutique. She would sell flowers in the summer. She would sell nuts in the winter. She was so amazing trying to maximize anything that she had around the house. So I think this is where my, my ethos and my philosophy of, like Freda said, I don't want to depend on one thing. I'm, I'm not, it's not that I'm not the kind of person who goes to the office from nine to five, but mm -hmm. even if I'm in the office from nine to five, there's multiple things happening. Um, I think one of the reasons why Freda and I have this, this uh, outspoken mini series is even though we're insanely busy, and I think you said that you're even busier during this lockdown than before, we felt like there's an opportunity, even if there's only 30 people listening, we feel like this is something that we want to do. So I think hustling means constantly keeping an eye on opportunities, maximizing the utility of everything that you do, uh, and, and doing it with purpose. Nice. Nice. Well, for myself, it, uh, it's a little different for me. So my dad came from Indonesia. He was born uh, right after World War II. And for my mom, she grew up in Vietnam. And um, she was so talented when she was in school. She could write well, she speaks well, until I think there was a point where she was almost getting into trouble with the government. So my grandfather, he had no choice but to send her away. So that's how she got to Taiwan and met my dad who was studying there. And I think in so many ways, because, because of everything that they have gone through, to have that stability, to have that one job and to stay at one place, it's considered a luxury. Mm. So my dad worked 30 over years for DuPont and he got into Six Sigma training and be, became a trainer. He did that for years. And for my mom, um, she was so dedicated to the family. She cooks for us. We spend time together. So that kind of stability, it's something that I'm so used to until the point when I finally got out to work myself. And I realized, oh my God, this is so not for me. <laughs> I, I did accountancy in school. So during my internship, I was working for a local hotel. I was in the, uh, I was in the financial HQ. I was going through my paperwork every single day. And then I was doing inventory checks and I was running to the bank to bank the checks. And I was like, you sure this is what life is about? It cannot, it cannot be like this. I can't die before I die. I need something else. And plus, I wasn't really doing well in school. I was just flunking my, my modules and I wasn't, my balance sheet, they don't balance. You can't be <laughs> an accountant where you don't get balance, the, the, everything balanced. So that's why I figured that I needed something different. And that's how I joined the media industry. And everything kind of picked up from there. That's when I realized that having a diversity in life, it is such an enriching experience. So yeah. now I'm a big believer of the slash life. Has anyone heard of it? Tell us. Okay, so I think this came from a, uh, columnist, a columnist from the New York Times. It's about a slash life. So this is how I will introduce myself nowadays. I'm a TV presenter slash new media content creator slash columnist slash voiceover artist slash media trainer slash MC. You know, the list goes on. So. This is about taking a multiple roles in life so that instead of just creating multiple, oh, thank you. I know it's really smart, right? Because it's not so much about having this multiple source of income, but being able to diversify your life and to get all these different life experiences. And I think this is where the hustling comes in. We don't glorify busyness for the sake of it. Being a hustler means you're constantly engaged. It, it means you're constantly being stimulated and almost feeling that, that neurons connecting and making that new connections, sparking new ideas in your head and almost have your pores open up when you're learning something new. And that I find is so addictive. Mm, yeah, mm. You're, you're, I've, I've, got, I've got that slash, I've got a couple of slashes for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I need you to just see a list. <laughs> it makes you, you sound so much better than somebody who doesn't know what it's doing. <laughs> so, no, you've uh, got it. Go ahead. 
No, you got a very interesting story uh, out from from because uh, you're also a travel uh, correspondent, right? Yes. And you did mm -hmm. something out for Japan. And yes. I thought it would be very interesting to share it with with uh, the the viewers here today. Okie doke. Okay, here's the story coming right up. This is um, I think the great thing about being able to travel is you get to experience how it changes you as a person. Let me go back to the very beginning of it. Okay, uh, is everyone able to see it on the screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. So this is the Tojinbo cliff. In, um, in Japanese kanji, it's Dongshunfang. It's a village that's to the west of um, Tokyo. It's about in a half an hour plane ride. Okay, so you can see, it's a small town that's built right next to a cliff. And this is how the cliff looks like. If you look really closely, it's like a claw that extends into the sea. And the view here is so majestic, but creepy at the same time. Because this is one of the most famous suicide cliffs in Japan. This is where people travel to, to kill themselves. I was there to talk to this person. He is known as the Jotomade-san. Jotomade meaning, please wait. Because he is the one who patrols the cliff. And if, if he sees anyone who is about to commit suicide, he will go, Jotomade kudasai. And then he will start talking to the person. That's how the name came about, the Jotomade-san. So um, the name is Mr. Shige. I was there to talk to him. And this is me following him around, um, around the cliff. The daily petrol route, uh, it's about a 1.4 km walk up and down the slopes. I'm telling you, it's a killer. I couldn't do it, man. I, I was totally freaking out. It was really scary. And there were a lot of uh, blind spots around the cliff. So as you can see, there are a lot of spots where you need your binoculars. You have to see it from the opposite. That's the only, only way to monitor it. And you have to fly a drone to make sure you cover every corner of the cliff because chances are you will find someone hiding at a corner ready to jump off the cliff. Mm. It's madness. So this is the view. This is what you see. It's, it's pretty scary. It's so windy. I could feel, I, I, I felt like I could smell death in a place like this, it's madness. Okay, does anybody want to make a guess? What's the time that people are most likely to jump off a cliff? Hmm. Mm. Late in the day? Mm. After dinner. <laughs> Why would you want to? <laughs> okay, actually, so Frida, you got it. <laughs> okay, it's not so much about the dinner, but um, people jump off okay. in the middle of the night. Really? Oh, okay. Yes, because it's less scary this way because you don't see a thing. Because right. with a view like this, it takes a lot of courage to jump off. So this is what he would do. You know, there, there are a lot of benches that's around the cliff. So this is right. what Mr. Shige would do. He would patrol this area uh, in the late afternoon. So if, he's find, if he finds anybody sitting on a bench all by himself, maybe with a backpack, maybe his thoughts, maybe writing a note, he would go up to the person and go and ask if he's feeling okay. You know, they do that whole daijobu desu thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So chances are, he, he, so, so those are the tell signs. He'll be able to tell. He's an ex-policeman himself. So right. if he sees someone in trouble, he will try to talk to the person at this point. And chances are, this is a time when they are willing to talk, but still pretty determined to, to kill themselves at this point. So this is not when he talks him out of the idea. But the idea is to keep him on the bench for as long as possible, just to carry on the conversation until they get hungry. You know, it's freaking cold out there. So right. when a person feels hungry, he would suggest that they go back to the eatery. There's a small eatery by the side to have some freshly made mochi. So you guys might have guessed it by now. Mr. Shige, aka Chodomade son, he opened this snack shop. He and his group of volunteers, they made freshly made, they have freshly made mochi. This stuff are so good, I tell you. No pun intended, but these are two that I for. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is, so this is usually when they will really open up to start talking about their problems. And this is when 
Mr. Shige talks them out of the idea and he actually go, he has gone as far as building a shelter for people where they can right. stay for a couple of months before they can reset themselves. So here on the wall, you'll be able to see all the photos sent to him from the people, people that he has helped along wow. the years. Yeah, he has saved thousands of lives through his work. Uh, I met him two, days, two years ago, so that means he's been on this for about 17 years. That's how long he's been doing this. And this is us enjoying the mochi and having a little bit of chit chats and chillax a little bit. And uh, just when I thought that we've got all the stories that we needed, this happened. Yeah. Can anyone tell what it is? Backpack. Yeah, it's a backpack. So they found a backpack. Um, so there's a drill. You find a backpack. Chances are there's there'll be a pair of shoes right next to it. You'll be able to find a letter, and then this is where the police will come in, the helicopters will come in, and start searching the area, looking for the body. So while we were having mochi one, one and have, hmm? One of our guests has her mic on. Christine, do you mind turning off your mic, please? Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. So this happened while we were having our chat when we were at the eatery. And even till now, I question myself if we didn't keep Mr. Shige busy, if he weren't filming with us, could he wow. have saved another life? And um, uh -huh. it turned out that it was a 20 year old young man. He was having some problems. I think it was academic issues in life. And you know, Jap in Japan, it's a pretty stressful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So while all this was happening, we were busy capturing the footage. Uh, we were also trying to process this while he just watched quietly from the side. He didn't say a word. Mm. And he does this as a volunteer, right? Yes. I mean, just as, and he's been doing this for 17 years. Yes. Speaking of hustling, huh? Yeah, I know, right? And this is what he has dedicated his life to do. And imagine how powerful it can be when you're fully committed to a cause that you truly believe in and the, all the lives that you can change, all the people they can help. You know, at the end of the day, I wanted to ask him for a photo, but um, because I was still trying to process all the different emotions myself and I didn't feel that it was appropriate. And of course, you know, being a TV presenter, you guys know what, would know what I mean. You're kind of present, but also a little detached at the same time. So I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. I feel so sad. But yet at the same time, I was like, oh my God, we got a good story. This is a good story to tell. It's sick. But you know, it was just a lot, of, a lot to take in at the moment. And I think he read my mind. And he asked me for this photo when obviously I was the one who wanted it. So why did you want to tell us this story in the this, in this subject of, of hustling? Like, it's, it's such a powerful story. But, but tell us a little bit about what motivated to share this story since we're talking about hustling. Yes, I feel that in so many ways, hustling, it's about being committed to a cause that you truly believe in. It's not about being busy all the time. It's about putting your mind and soul into something that, that you know it will make a difference. And right. I think this is what Mr. Shige has been doing in his own way. He keeps it quiet. It's all about soul and science at the first, it, you know, when he talks to people, it's about bearing his souls, about building genuine connections. But the way that he approached these people, it's all science. Being a policeman, he's training this aspect. And this is him putting his core and the skill set that he has picked up in his professional line right. to work. Right. This is how he hustles. He works like 12, 13 hours a day just to, just to patrol this place and make sure everyone is taken care of. Right, which is which is a very interesting question that someone asked during register, you know, to register for this event. It says, how do you keep yourselves motivated during the hustling phase, and what should we do to gain more confidence when life hits us hard? And I think maybe this is a, a situation when when you when you look when you're trying to connect the story and what the persons are asking as well, right? What what hustling is all about? Um, you know. Do you have any thoughts around this? Maybe, Prof, you, you have a thought about it? I, well, I've been doing it a lot, obviously. Uh, I think one of, the, uh, one of the, the reasons why we hustle so much is because 
you go back and forth between the good and the bad, right? You, uh, uh, but I think hustling is also um, a survival strategy. And those of us who have very strong survival um, instinct, we naturally hustle, right? So for me, if I think about, so right now I have a very good life. I have to say, uh, I don't know exactly what I deserve to, to, to live the way I live right now. And I still hustle. Uh, when I was a lot younger, and I would have, like I said, this, this crazy jobs, uh, uh, literally like surviving from one day to another, there was, in my, in my South, there was no room for failure. Mm. I could have done something little. I could have gone back and live with my parents. I could have gone and, and not have a college degree. I could have gone and, and live in a very, very small place, having a small job. But for some reason, I always thought there has to be more. Right, so I right. think on one hand is the survival element, but it's also a drive for better. And better is not always more money. Better is not yeah. always more a bigger house or things like that. Better is getting yourself out of a place of pain. Mm -hmm. And whatever that is, if, if your relationship is, is in a place of, place of pain, if your job, if your uh, environment, if the way you feel about yourself, we talked about this last, last week, Freda, about image issues and things like that. So I think hustling is, is this combination of, on one hand, survival skills, and along with that, this, this need for embatterment for various reasons. Mm -hmm. I, uh, anyway, I, I see Julina Halim has joined us as well. <laughs> it's my sister. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so hi, Julina. Um, yeah, uh, your, what about you? Uh, uh, you? What do you have to say about it with, with that question? Yes. Uh, how do you feel yourself motivated and, and all that? Well, I think being motivated, it's about going back to, going back to how you feel about the cause. It's always mm -hmm. about the root of where your energy comes from. It's about your values and what you really believe in. But I do believe that the right way, the way to build confidence, I, I'm not a believer of faking until you make it. Right. I've tried it multiple times and I got a lot of faking, but never really making it until I actually gained the right skill sets. So I do feel that knowledge is the path to everything. If you're if you're having issues with your abilities, if you're, doubt, you're doubting yourself, if you don't know if you're doing it right and you have that imposter syndrome in full swing, always keep an objective mindset. Always analyze what you have to offer to the market and mm -hmm. analyze what's available in the market. What are your competitors doing? Keep objective, right. just like Mr. Shige. You know, for mm -hmm. something that... Um, he, it's like the SOP that he has when he approaches somebody. You always have a systematic routine to fall back on. So that's when you just do it. You, not, you do not let your, yourself hold you back. You do mm. what you're supposed to do. You know exactly what you're, you're doing. And with the right knowledge, with the right mentality, you execute your actions. And that's it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. I was uh, um, there's this book that I I, I read I read called uh, Playing Big I don't have it here right now uh, by Tara Moore and uh, in the Hebrew language there's there's two words for for fear the English language has fear but the Hebrew language has two words one is called Pasha one is called Yira I can't remember which is which but one is the fear of you know uh, a, a snake will bite me that that kind of you know reptilian fear right the yeah. other fear the other word for fear is like wow, what if I tried something and it, it, it's exciting, but it's scary at the same time, you won't die from it. But I, I always love trying to expand my, my comfort, my comfort mm. zone, right? To try something else to, ex, what do we call it? Expand out my, my tent, right? To see what more mm. I can do. So I've always learned to do that. And just recently, I, I'm currently doing a course in design thinking and we talk about prototyping, right? Prototyping yeah. with products. Why don't you prototype your life? I said, try different things, right? Because the work doesn't work, lah, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and have that spirit, right? Whether it's good times or bad times. And I think if you, when it's good times and you have that spirit, during bad times, you know how to get out. You, you know how to think a little bit yes. more differently. It's only you when you have the framework to fall back on. Yeah. Yes, yes, right? So do it when times are good, not when times are bad. Because right now, um, and just this morning, I was having a conversation with someone as well. Whatever's going right on right now, if we've had time to process our feelings, 
yeah. if this whole uh, situation, I remember the first two days of the, the lockdown and you know what happened in Malaysia, right? Because I was still angry about what's happened politically and then this happened, right? So there's a lot of anger and I, I, and I said, okay, this is anger. It's a feeling. Let me process that feeling of anger, right? And not suppress it. Uh, so I screamed into the pillow. I did all these sort of things. I couldn't go running. <laughs> we, we weren't allowed to go to the park and everything, right? So, but like I know, then I started doing exercise from home and everything. Okay, now, now, now self-regulate. Right. What, what can I do now? What can I, I, I take control of? You know, on that note, um, you know, as a media trainer, I get asked all the time, what happens if you make a mistake on air? I was like, oh. yeah, I was like, is anyone going to die from it? No, right. right? Then, was was there blood? No blood? Okay. Exactly. <laughs> no one got killed. <laughs> when, you, when you have a child and you, you know, he cries when he was young, I said, no blood, you're fine. Then. Yeah, then you're okay. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday, I gave an interview to my alma mater. Um, the, the students from my, uh, my university back in Romania, and uh, they asked me, what advice do I have for them how to approach fear? Yeah. And I was a little bit taken back by this, like, you're 22 years old, you're 25 years old, what are you afraid of? Like, why would you approach life with fear when at this point you have so many options, and even if one doesn't, you know, doesn't turn out the way you want, there's still so many more. It's not like you're Oh, by the way, you know, our former prime minister, I don't think he said, yeah, I'm too old to run for, for, for prime ministry, right? He's like, yeah, I'm going to try it. And I, I told, the, I told the, the students, I said, why would you approach this with fear? Like approach it, and I actually said similar to what Freda said, approach it with, with prototyping mentality, right? right? Try this one, if it works, it doesn't work. Try this one, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But learn something from, from each. And okay. I think... Um, there is something to be said about hustlers. I think hustlers are not just these people who constantly try new things or they have the slash life, but they also learn from, from each of the slashes, right? How you said, you learn from this slash and you bring it in the other slash yeah. and then the other slash and then the other slash. And you actually become a lot better at everything because I am sure that your media training helped you to be a, a much better uh, uh, media person, right? Or for me, in my case, I became a coach I was never, I never planned to be a coach, but it turns out that by, by investing in my teaching, I, I, I became a coach as well. So there's something to be said about the value of learning from slash to slash. Yes. Can yeah. you imagine you have, all, you have a different learning curve for every one of your slashes and everything right. adds up together and you create this huge graph and that consolidates everything that you yes. have to offer. Yeah. And, and you can try, yeah, like you say, you can try something and you don't like it. That's fine, you know? Yeah. Try something else. Yeah, right? I did acting and was like, okay, not my thing. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> that I did acting or that's not my thing? That's not your thing. Not that you, <laughs> it's very natural to see you as an actress, but that is not your thing. Well, I, I think back to the spirit of hustling, it's about allowing yourself to experience different things. I feel, I think it's so many ways that, the, uh, the training, all the, everything that we were taught in the acting, it applies to life. Absolutely. And it can be so valuable for everyone because it's all about being able to deploy your emotions. And by doing that, you analyze all the emotions that we go through in real life. It's about right. having an understanding of life, being able to dissect it, analyze it, and decide on how you want to react to it. Right. I love what said allowing yourself to experience new things and i think a lot of us do not allow ourselves to even experience yeah. something because it, we are so afraid of what would happen and two what would people think yes exactly what if people hate me what if i fail who cares right i, I know from and i don't really care what people think right so long as i'm not hurting you right so long as i'm not hurting you and uh, it's it's you know it's just it's just ego and, and pride no but even like when I talk about the early days of me like singing with the, the, the choir, right? Ooh, uh, and it's not a solo. And it's not, I, I really loved it. I love the learning of vocal training uh, and understanding how breath works. Uh, I'm not a singer, but also uh, standing in, in front of a stage at 17, 18 years Ooh. old to learn. Get, and you've got a group of people. So, okay, 
fine. I got a group of people. That's what it feels like. Then, of course, you know, <laughs> now you're comfortable standing on stage by yourself. But that training came 30 years ago, right? So, it's, just right. That, so it's not just about singing, but it's everything you learn yeah. in that process and applying it and adding on to it. Uh, the biblical, biblical uh, saying is to, to multiply your talents. You know, uh, um, you know, and he, he will give you more. You know, the moment you do, if you, you know, God gives you this, and you do it more, and you multiply it, he will give you more. And there is a reason for this, right? To to be of service to people. At the end of the day, I think as you as you get older, you know that uh, there is a reason why you place with certain skills, certain talents. There is a piece that you fit in in this puzzle of life, right? In this tapestry of life. Somebody mentioned the book. Somebody mentioned the uh, uh, designing your life. Yes. Uh, yes. So I also wanna I wanna provide a, a reference since we're talking about books today. One of my favorite books that I'm reading right now. It's called Range by mm -hmm. David Epstein, and Range is all about hustling. It's not. It doesn't specifically talk about hustling. It, it's it's not a definition of hustling, but Range actually talks about the value of trying many 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 different things that might not be. Sure it at all and then they build into your expertise so uh, i want to give you an example there's in medicine and again i'm not a doctor so i'm sorry if i'm going to misquote this but in medicine there is a tendency to over specialize right so it used to be that you're specialized on cancer now you are not specialized on cancer now you're specialized on the left ovary type of cancer uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that the book says is uh, the, the doctors are afraid of specialists of an ear and they will ask you which ear, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> wow. What is he saying? And he's saying that this is what they found out. There are doctors who do not overly specialize in the beginning, but they try pretty much everything as much as possible in the early days. They can be, become much better specialists later on in life Ooh. because they learn from every single little thing or big thing prior to that, and they can become much better. Mm. Another example that he uses is a very famous example of, of um, the, the, the Swiss tennis player. Um, what's his name? The, fa the very famous Swiss tennis Was player. No, Nadal Spanish. Uh, Federer? Yeah, yeah. Federer, uh, Federer. yeah. Um, so Federer started by playing balls, every ball. Mm. tennis ball, ping pong, basketball, football, um, handball, volleyball, pretty much all the balls you can imagine. And when analysts look at his uh, style of, of playing, and then when they look at his expertise, they say he, not, he doesn't really play tennis like a tennis player. He plays mm. like somebody who sees the ball from a football perspective, from a basketball perspective, from a handball perspective, from from a ping pong perspective. And he actually attributes a lot of his success to the fact that he developed such a wide range that he learned from Slash, right? He was oh, a right. player slash basketball player slash this player that he was slashing every ball, right? <laughs> so I want to recommend this book. It's, it's full of stories. It's actually a very, very easy book. It's full of stories of, of slashing. Wow, that's lovely. I realize the thing that could be stopping us from exposing ourselves to all the different experiences is fear. And that is something that, oh my gosh, how many pair of glasses do you have? <laughs> this, this is from my dear friend Zoraida Zainal Abidin, anyway, who's asking. <laughs> and we've got a very in interesting question here from Janice. How do we find a balance between focusing on our niche, perfecting our craft, and diversifying, taking on multiple roles in life, the slash life? Very good question. This is Janice Wong, my friend as well. Okay, anyway. Mm. Oh, I read something from the seven habits of successful people about this. It's right. about your production capability versus okay. the actual production. You make time for production, yes, but you make time to build up that reserve. They're both equally important. And it depends on which phase of your life you're at. You know you have to focus on one thing, but you can rotate a little bit between that. So I guess this is a reference that you need where you need to find that balance that works for you at that point in your life. Right. Uh, so so the, the, the book, sorry, Prof, you're going to say something? No, go ahead. 
so the, the 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 book that I'm currently writing, so I'm just going through all these things. So, you know, like in, in my 30s, I actually spent a large bulk of my life working from home, right? Because uh, my, my son was very young at that time. And so during that period, I, um, working from home and my, my focus was that bundle of joy, right? Uh, but during that period, I also know that he's going to grow up and not want to have not want to have anything to do with me like now. Um, <laughs> like, so, but I was that was when I started taking my coaching course, my NLP course, and going for other courses. Just sort of, and not knowing that radio was going to happen. This was before radio. I was really also a part time TV news, so I already had all these things going. But I was studying other things at that time. So even during that period, right? So you'll find that there are different points in your life where you're able to upskill and reskill. I always tell people to do that, regardless of it. And it's not about money, huh? It's about just being uh, updated up here, right? Um, and I found that these skills were very helpful as I and as I as I conduct interviews, um, you know, like learning coaching. It, that helps me in my my job as a as a radio presenter now because I ask a lot of questions. Right? So everything sort of connects and you'll find these moments and you'll find now that you actually have time, there are a lot of resources that you can do online and learn, right? So yeah. for me, it's also a function of how far, how far uh, apart are the slashes, right? So mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm listening to your slashes, you're actually within the same environment, right? It has to do with, with speaking, with communication, with, with being on camera, with helping people. So it's not like I'm slash a minor, slash a gymnast, slash a president, slash this, slash that. I'm sure there are people like that, but not me. But I think the slashes come from your areas of curiosity and it helps yeah. a lot if they converge, right? A little bit. I feel mm. that there is one thing that we can, um, we can use as a good reference is the three M's. This is especially so given that most of us are spending most of our time at home right now. The three M is mainly uh, mindfulness. First of all, you think about what you do, you be fully present for what you do. You experience it, make sure you learn from it. Your movement, you use your body, you keep it active, you keep the blood flowing and make sure you have oxygen in your brain. And lastly, it's mastery. You learn new things. You you perfect your skills, you bring your knowledge up to a different level. Oh, beautiful, thank you. Oh, I love your handwriting, oh my gosh. Ah, okay, <laughs> so, so for, yes. move, for movement, you can uh, contact Julina Halim. <laughs> yeah, who's right here in the chat group. So this is, what, this is how everything comes together. Oh, and my sister Julina, she's a perfect example. She was training, uh, she's a trained nutritionist. She's a trained tango, Oh, yes. help me out here, Jelena. Tango therapist, a Pilates instructor. So these are movement. Having this yeah. knowledge in movement, it helps to building a holistic training for anyone who wants to go through that transformation in life. So this is how, you know, on the surface, nothing looks related. Like how is Pilates even related to nutrition? But they do. Right. Because your mind and your body, everything works together. So eventually, I do believe that it's all about connecting the dots. Yeah. Yes. The Looking moment you connecting dots. Exactly. As long as you can create that unique pattern that belongs to you, this is mm. how you create your niche. It's your own algorithm. Yes. Mm. And no one can fight with you. You have no competitors. You have pretty much eliminate all competition because Pretty. that's your market. You're the only one who can offer that. You know, it's so interesting. I, I just realized why so many people think I'm such an unconventional professor. I think because my algorithm is made of pieces that do not naturally go together in this box. Exactly. Like, I've never met a professor with red spectacles and oh, really? funky Korean outfits. You, you think that this is unconventional about me? Oh, stay, gosh. Stay online yeah. after before this. Okay. <laughs> I, I, this is a very good question from One Bear 70 he said, when and what was your greatest hurdle you had ever encountered? How did you overcome or hustle over it? Uh, your personal story or testimony might help us at, timely at this trying time. Mm. Mm. I mean, this year, this <laughs> past five years, the past 10 years, the past 20 years, I think, I think every, no, not decade in the sense, but every time frame in your life, comes with a big 
big hurdle. Uh, yesterday when I was uh, talking to my former, uh, not students, like my alma mater, I was actually reflecting that I hated college. I did not enjoy my college experience. And they asked, me, they asked me to be a speaker as a sort of like a motivational speaker for this and like an inspiring speaker. And I said, I, I hated my life in college. I don't know why you want me to talk about it. But for me, that was a big, big trying time. I didn't like my program. I didn't like my school. I didn't like what I was learning. I didn't like myself, most of all. And mm. that was a huge hurdle. And I think getting over the hurdle of not liking myself improved the rest of my life dramatically. So for me, the biggest hurdle in life was not not having the roof or sleeping on the bench because I did that, not having, being all by myself in a new country. The biggest hurdle in my life was getting over the fact that I did not like myself, accepting to like myself later on. And then now I like myself a little bit too much, as you can tell. But uh, uh, I think that was the biggest hurdle for me. And once that hurdle was, I got over it, things started to be a lot easier. Things started to come into place. Uh, the life became a much more enjoyable experience. And the way I did it, uh, that's a very long story. Maybe we'll save that for another special episode. Ah, for another episode. Uh, okay, Can, I'll, I'll share a little bit here. Um, every decade of my life, there would be Ish, there would be challenges, right? There'd be challenges. And it seems like the whole world at that point, right? When I was 10, I, I, and I'll just share how, just, just the, when I was about from zero to 10, um, everybody in my family uh, living in Brunei had a permanent residence except me. No, I don't understand why, right? So I had my family continue to stay there. I had to leave at 18. And when this is your world, this is the country you're born in, and you think, my God, I don't have a place on my own. I mean, I was Malaysian, but I have no identity and connection. So that seemed like the biggest problem at that time. You know, many years later on, I understand why the door was closed there because I don't want to live in that country. <laughs> right? and, and God said, no, we are not going back, right? But what, a, what a, a question here also, having said, learned NLP, when you go through these things, right? So this is a situation, as I was telling you, process the situation, okay, and, uh, and say, this is a, when words like, it's a trying time, yes, it is. It's a trying time for all of us, right? At varying degrees. The question is now, what can I do about it? What are three things I can do to get out of this situation? It's probably a question mm -hmm. you have to ask. It's very important because when you ask these questions, as opposed to, it's so difficult, it's a hurdle, I don't know what to do, your mind stops. But if you just say three things, what are three possibilities that I can do to overcome this? And the answer is within yourself. I believe we are all resourceful. We, and it's not about money. It's about resourceful and thinking of ideas. We're all capable of doing that. And just by asking a question, three things I can do to alter a situation, right? And there's so many aspects of life. I, I know that one time was I couldn't control the situation with my marriage, but I could control my fitness. So I started exercising and that was within my control. And when I got some control over that, it just gave me the confidence to do something else, right? So things I can't control, things I can control, the confidence from being able to do something I can control, can control changed my perspective of a situation, uh, which has not changed, but has changed my perspective. Wow. I feel that in so many ways I can connect to each of your stories. When I was growing up, my family, we were moving around and Okay, going back to the time when I was six, I was sent to the American school when I didn't speak any English. I was the only little crybaby in class. I had no idea what was going on. And through my entire life, I was, it was always about fitting in, I was struggling to be just one of them. I, I had no idea who them were. And then after I got into the industry, it's all about standing out. And then it became trying to stand out, but yet trying to fit in at the same time. And then it was from there, I was growing to hate my work. I never really hated myself, kind of. There were definitely bad days, but I never really hated myself. But I hated everything that I see every single day. I hate that mm. highway. I have to travel to work early in the morning. I hate the lamppost. I hate the gate at, the, at outside Media Corp because that reminds me of work. I hated my office, every single thing. Even when people were nice to me. And then that was when I realized what I really hated was the routine was how everything was so expected. There were no more surprises in life. 
and I got really lucky because I got offered the chance to do a, a travel log. So that's how I started traveling and going to all the different places. After having that opportunity to step out, to see how life is like from against a different cultural backdrop in a different country with very different government, with very different resources, that got me thinking on how I should handle my life. And I feel that by stepping out, it gives me a fresh perspective on how I can look inside. And I think that's a mindset that has helped me along, along this, all these years. Right. Well, we've extended ourselves, Prof, uh, wow. which is great. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, is our, you know, so anyway, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the first of our four-part series. I don't know if we'll do it again in the future, but, you know, if you all have any suggestions and topics, uh, that you'd like us to chat about, uh, we'd love to, you know, and we'll, we'll try to get relevant people to, to join us as well. And thank you so much, you know, you, you all the way across the causeway. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> we'll, we'll continue to leave a tap on so you'll have water from Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, we need that. Yes, please. And the shopping and the food. Thank you, I need that. <laughs> So, okay. oh, yeah. so I, I think uh, I think today is our closing day of the, the first four episodes of this series. Uh, this was an attempt that we put together in order to hustle our way through this uh, this lockdown. Uh, I think uh, uh, all the themes that we had, and by the way, Frida came up with all this this themes: uh, being bold, dealing with guilt, uh, facing being typecast, uh, hustling. Uh, were all themes that were so fundamentally uh, relevant for for us, and and not only relevant for the um, uh, for the time of the lockdown, but but actually life stories. And one of the things that Fred and I said, we said we don't want to talk about lockdown. We don't want to talk about COVID. Not that it's not important. Obviously, it's defining our times. But we want to talk about. We simply want to talk about simple hard things. Mm. So uh, for those of you who've been with us for the past four weeks, thank you so much. It really was thank such you. a pleasure. Uh, we might come back. We might not come back. If you want us to come back, find us a sponsor. I like ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, before we leave. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, you, you want to say anything, you know, speaking to the Malaysian audience? <laughs> Well, I know this is a, this is, this is a weird time for all of us. And like what Prof said, this defines our time. And one day we will be looking back to this time and think about everything that we have done and maybe things that we have not done. So mm. do it with no regrets, make the best of it. So one day we can look back to this time with pride. Right. Wow. How, okay. I can't talk that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You know, Thank it's been you. great. Uh, have, a, have a good long week. We've got a long weekend. Uh, uh, and, then, and then, well, back to work-ish for all of us. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank weekend. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Be safe.